Blackpool, Lancashire, UK, a historic seaside resort home to all manner of typical coastal tourist attractions, with its peers, the somewhat dubiously named Pleasure Beach, and of course, the Blackpool Tower, which, when built in 1894, was apparently the tallest building in the British Empire. So that's uh, interesting. Also famous for its Christmas illuminations, the switching on of which has been performed by legends of stage and screen, such as the Bee Gees, Kermit the Frog, and Red, Red Rum, who was a horse, so not really sure how that worked. And, and this year, Blackpool was also the home of the Play Expo, held at the Norbreck Castle Hotel. Not a castle, and according to some TripAdvisor reviews, not much of a hotel either. Although that's not going to stop me going. Look at the floor plan. There's going to be tons of stuff to do. Arcade machines, retro machines, pinball, rhythm games, and ant stream. Someone must have left the sugar out. I've got my ticket and the place opens at 10am. Looking on the map, it's three and a half hours away, just over half of the country, so with a nice 6am start, it's time to hit the road. Here at The Shack, we'd like to give a huge thank you to the sponsor for this video, PCB Way. They help us out with all of our PCB fabrication needs and make fantastic boards at amazingly competitive prices. And it's not only PCBs that are on the menu. Apart from other fabrication services like CNC machining, 3D printing, sheet metal fabrication and injection molding, PCB Way also have a great projects library of cool stuff to build from people all around the world. Oh, and if you don't like waving a soldering iron about, they can even assemble your PCBs for you. That's the PCB way. Right, on with the show. I've got to say that I'm impressed with the scale of the event. There are literally hundreds of arcade games here and all on free play. The sights and sounds of these arcade machines really evokes memories of the hours and hours that I would spend in arcades as a kid. Asteroids here ate up a significant portion of my early childhood funds, and it's no less fun to play today. There are machines here that are very familiar, and some that are totally new to me. And seeing all of these machines lined up like this and being enjoyed by so many people really underlines the social side of gaming brought about by arcades in the 70s and 80s. Modern online multiplayer might be fun, but there's nothing to match the visceral, guttural challenge of single screen arcade multiplayer action. Just past the arcade section are the hundreds of retro computers and consoles set up on tables for people to play on. Aside from your usual suspects, such as the Atari 2600 and the ColecoVision, there's this Binatone system which I'm fairly certain we had in our house at some point in my childhood. There are also some lesser spotted machines in the UK, such as this early Nintendo Famicom or family computer. We're more used to the Nintendo Entertainment System in this part of the world. Bridging the generation gap, there's this Sega Mega Drive sitting next to an ill-fated 3DO machine. Oh dear. As well as these vintage machines enticing you into play, there's also a LAN gaming section where games such as Red Alert, Dark Rain and Warcraft let you pit yourself against other visitors in a good old fashioned LAN party. Red Alert 2 has always been my RTS of choice and I'm proud to say that I once beat 7 AI opponents on hard mode while playing as Russia. If you know the game, you'll know why I'm proud of it. The retro computer front is just as well represented as the consoles, with almost every computer that was popular in the UK at one time or another being present and correct, including this absolutely beautiful Sony Hitbit MSX, which I must get my hands on one day. Next to the BBC Micro and the C64C is the one missing Spectrum model in my collection, the Spectrum 128K Plus 3. This one fitted with a GoTek drive, which is rather more practical than relying on scarce and fragile three inch discs these days. Here's the CPC 464 Plus, a facelifted 464, more in keeping with the Amiga ST Archimedes design, and next to it, one of my holy grails, 
the stunning looking Auric Atmos. More on that later. Never seen one of these before, it's an attractively named PC-KD863G, which is an NEC multi-sync monitor with a PC engine built in. Very cool indeed. And here's the Casio Loopy, a Japanese console from 1995, targeted primarily at female gamers, this one playing Bow Wow Puppy Love Story. Different times people, different times. A couple more familiar faces, the Amstrad CPC6128 and an Atari 600XL, whose bigger brother featured on the channel a little while ago. This deathmatch layout is set up for those Xbox things, they all seem to be enjoying themselves, bless them, and you've probably gathered by now that if you're a fan of video games, especially but not exclusively of the retro variety, then this event is the place to be. But what if you're more taken with watching small steel balls getting pissed all over the place? Well, Play Expo has you covered there also, with a huge array of pinball machines to play on. There are various events going on throughout the weekend where hapless souls, including possibly me, get dragged up on stage and demonstrate their skill on the Donkey Kong bongos, amongst other things. Back at the Joust machine, and it's unfortunately still out of order, despite there being a dedicated repair tent at the centre of it all keeping these machines going. I settled instead for setting the high school on missile command. That's me, Sax the Mad Axe Man, don't ask. This is early on Saturday morning, so I'm quite sure it won't be the top score for long. Another absolute favourite of mine, I was Luke Skywalker while I was playing this back in the day, a simply stunning arcade experience. And then I spotted it, my one true love outside of Mrs Retroshack, Robotron 2084, my absolute favourite game of all time. If that becomes free, that's the day done for me. More shenanigans on the stage, and then I went into the trading hall, where a very special guest took some time to talk to me. Remember our last episode on the CD32, and I blamed Doom for the death of the machine. Here's a recap. Well, John Carmack of ID Software, who wrote the game, effectively revealed the Amiga's fate when he allegedly stated in a response to a request to port Doom to the Amiga, the Amiga is not powerful enough to run Doom. It takes the full speed of a 68040 to play the game properly, even if you have a chunky pixel mode in hardware. Having to convert to bit planes would kill it, even on the fastest Amiga hardware. Well, John Romero of id Software was at the event, and here's what he had to say about it. On video, can you admit that you are responsible for the death of the Amiga? Yeah, unfortunately the Amiga could not uh, draw the graphics uh, the way that Doom does at that frame rate, so had to kill the platform. I also met with the legend that is Jim Bagley, but that's going to be the subject of a whole other episode. Watch this space, and thanks for the reminiscing, Jim. So, uh, on the whole, Play Expo turned out to be a great event, and I'll definitely be going to the next one. Thanks to everyone who came up and said hello, it's always nice to meet people, and it's also nice that Mrs Retroshack keeps me grounded. I mentioned to her that some people had said hi, and asked for photos, to which she replied, alright, you're not Johnny Depp, fair enough. Ok, remember I mentioned that Auric Atmos earlier? Well, there was one up for sale in the trading hall, so I had to grab that to help complete my collection of fruit-based computers from the 80s and 90s, the Auric Atmos being a creation of Tangerine computers of course. Anyway, there will be more of that in an upcoming episode, but for now I'll let you all go and do something more interesting and I'm going to rest my weary legs. Thanks Blackpool, Play Expo organisers, John Romero, Jim Bagley and everyone I met at the show, and until next time in the Retro Shack, it's goodbye from me.